in the front. Let's take a bottle. Does Stuart, do you like some water? Yeah, that would be nice. With or without? Without. fortunate to have um, a group of scholars who will be talking to you who have um, done a lot of work on Europe and um, I'll just introduce the two on the panel today who will be presenting and then um, we will open for discussion. Um, the first is Professor William Othwaite who is an emeritus professor from Newcastle University, the School of Geography, Politics and Sociology, which sounds transdisciplinary enough to attract our attention <laughs> here at IASC. Um, he does research and has published on social theory, the philosophy of social science, the history of social thought, political sociology and contemporary Europe and is currently working on European macro regions and a book on the global reception of Habermas's work. So think of some good questions for Professor Othwaite. Now, the other um, panelist here is um, Professor Stuart Holland, who many of you know quite well. He is one of our own because he's a research scholar here at IASC and he teaches in our MA program. Stuart has a very rich history of working with and advising um, prime ministers and, and <laughs> national governments, uh, especially the UK um, government where he was an MP in the, in, the, um, in the British Parliament. And so you are both welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and this morning, so we will begin with Professor Outhreet. Thanks very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be back in the centre of Europe. Um, I think you probably all know this Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. And um, I think that two of the major things that make our times interesting, in that rather nasty sense, um, are um, populism on the one hand uh, and polarisation, which I think go together. So populism, I think, has definitively now become the language of politics. So there's a sense in which even people, you, and parties and, and politicians that you wouldn't think of as populists are increasingly shifting in a populist direction. Um, and the polarisation, I think you can see it clearly in the British case where the UK remains absolutely 50-50 divided. Uh, over the issue of Brexit. I mean, the proportions have shifted very, very slightly from a, a slight majority to leave the European Union to a slight majority to remain in it. But, you know, it's too close to call. Uh, the pollsters will say, you know, it's within the margin of error. And the same polarisation you get with Trump, I think, in the US, um, or uh, with Erdogan, um, and um, in Poland, for example, between... Um, peace and the opposition, and perhaps in this country too. Um, and this is bad for the European Union because the European Union doesn't do populism. Uh, its politics is based on uh, consensus, compromise, uh, sometimes dirty compromise, but compromise nonetheless, and it really can't handle um, this shift towards populist politics, I think. Um, when Stuart and I were colleagues in the School of European Studies at Sussex University, I was very interested in Europe uh, and teach, spent half my time teaching about Europe, but not very interested in the European communities. Uh, it seemed very technical, detailed, uh, economistic and so forth, legalistic as well. And um, what really made me a partisan of European integration wasn't so much seeing the European institutions, though that, that kind of helped and got me more interested in them, but it was Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, I suddenly realized, or came to believe, that we needed European integration, some sort of framework which would put a control on rogue politicians, uh, as I saw her, like uh, Thatcher. 
Um, so the context of this um, talk, I just mentioned there um, a piece by Jan Jimski that he wrote for a, an issue of Discover Society, an online blog magazine, uh, and I edited that particular issue, having done one earlier, just on the, the, the day after the, uh, the Brexit referendum. So if, if you're really interested in ancient history, you can scroll back through Discover Society to that. But what Jan argues there in relation to Poland is that there are two ways of, as it were, de-Europeanizing. De One, uh, the British way, where you say, OK, we're leaving, slam the door. Uh, unfortunately, you've left all your belongings behind and you can't actually leave the door or you can't check out of Hotel California, um, if you know that old song by the Eagles. Um, the other way is to stay in, uh, the Polish-Hungarian way, where you say we want to remain in the European Union, but we want to trash the uh, institutions, the, the rule of law, uh, freedom of, of uh, press and so forth, all of the, the, the European uh, institutions. Um, so what th this piece that Jan, um, Jan is at uh, the Wazowski University in Warsaw, this then escalated into a special issue of a journal which he and Russell Foster are editing and the talk, uh, um, this talk is based on a longer paper which I'm happy to send if, if you're interested uh, on uh, de-Europeanisation, narrowing and shallowing. Um, so one of the many misleading slogans, I think, of the Brexiters in the UK is that the UK is leaving the European Union but not leaving Europe, um, which is true geographically, of course, but occludes the, the breaking up of a whole set of practical and ideational ties with the rest of Europe. And it's worth remembering, perhaps, that this isn't just a problem of the European Union, <laughs> Uh, that Mrs May's initial hostility when she was Home Secretary before she became Prime Minister was against the European human rights regime rather than the EU and um, it's quite possible that the UK, uh, if the Conservatives remain in power, will want to withdraw also from um, the Convention on Human Rights. Um, in, in relation to the, U the, the EU, um, you get the extreme kind of fantasy notion, at least in the early stages of the last two years, um, that the UK could create a sort of offshore economy like Hong Kong, Singapore or Georgia, with unilateral free trade relying primarily on financial services. And um, the downside of that, of course, uh, would be that uh, agriculture would close down, uh, manufacturing and what's left of it would also close down. Uh, there'd be a huge surplus population which would have to be managed in some sort of more or less authoritarian way. Um, on the brighter side, I mean, is there a happy Brexit? Um, you can just about, I think, conceive of the sort of... Um, Corbynite uh, Brexit scenario of egalitarianism, wonderful welfare provision, uh, full employment, social tolerance and so on. But I don't see that being economically viable in the UK, in, which is so plugged into the, uh, the world economy. So we missed our chance in the UK of becoming Norway uh, when we blew the money coming out of North Sea oil on uh, unemployment benefit rather than um, investment. So Norway put it into a state fund, the <coughs> British uh, Conservative government, the previous one, um, cut taxes, cut, cut, cut taxes uh, ran a boom and uh, frittered the money uh, away. Um, What's the rationale for Brexit? I, I won't go into the details of it, but uh, you certainly get people increasingly saying, um, Mrs May is starting to say this, that it's the EU which threatens national democracy, which she's been saying for a long time, and that, that populist politics is produced by the European Union. And you know, if you try to stop Brexit, um, you know, God help you, because populism will uh, enormously rise. Uh, as though populism had not been kind of stirred up by the, the Leave campaign. Um, now, the, 
I mentioned European values a moment ago, and I, I think it's important to avoid the sort of self-congratulatory discussion of that um, in the way that people talk about un-American in the Committee of Un-American Activities. Um, so, for example, capital punishment, I'd want to say, is, is non-European because uh, the European uh, human rights regime excludes capital punishment. Not so it's a legal provision, even if it's based on, on underlying uh, values. Um, what do we mean by Europeanization? I think we mean not just the acquis communautaire, but related practices, a whole range of norms, practical understandings, and so forth. Um, it also means, Europeanization means the interaction of national institutions with European ones, uh, what's sometimes called vertical integration, uh, or with equivalent institutions in other national states uh, in a European context, horizontal integration. So vertical integration, uh, national ministers meeting in the council, national civil servants <coughs> participating in the commission, judges and advocates general and their staff in the, the court <coughs> of justice. Um, and um, leaving the EU means, means breaking off all of these vertical links uh, and removing the, the structures of horizontal interaction. So for a third country, uh, interaction with, with the European Union becomes a matter of foreign ministries. You're, you're no longer kind of linked into to all of that. Uh, Europeanisation, for obvious reasons, gets discussed in relation to, to transnationalisation. So it's worth asking whether de-Europeanisation entails de-transnationalisation, uh, or what elements of the transnational persist outside the EU framework. Um, so if you think of Europeanisation, um, I mean, one of the things I want to I talk about, I mean, it's the kind of underlying theme of my book on contemporary Europe, is really that, that the integration process is partly institutional and partly external to the institutions. So air traffic, for example, is partly uh, in Europe, is partly underpinned by uh, a European Union uh, uh, regime, but also by um, cheap budget airlines, which are essentially a, a US invention taken over into Europe and transformed uh, travel um, in, across, across Europe. Um, so de-Europeanization, um, I mean, people talk about soft and hard Brexit. I think you can also talk about soft and hard de-Europeanisation. The first being a process where a member state diverges from the general European pattern, either through some sort of opt-out derogation uh, or through gradually and sometimes surreptitiously abandoning European norms. And the second case, the hard case of uh, withdrawing entirely, in the UK example, or deciding not to, to join the EU, uh, possibly the Turkish example. And in both cases, I think you can see quite uh, unpleasant uh, anti-EU propaganda, propaganda against um, independent judiciary, uh, against parliamentary institutions, uh, and so forth. Um, I'll spare you a discussion of uh, Nordic countries, but uh, it's worth mentioning that even if you're not uh, a member of the European Union, as in the Norwegian or Swiss case, you're still part of transnational regulation uh, through the World Trade Organization uh, and so on. So the Brexit fantasy is, is really just that. Um, I think one should need, what about opt-outs? Uh, if you like, this sort of softer version of de-Europeanisation, the taking back of certain sorts of powers. Um, and the uh, open method of coordination is, is the kind of jargon term uh, for describing that uh, form of, of um, uh, differentiated or flexible in integration. Um, it seems to work quite well in the Danish case, uh, which has got a number of opt-outs. Uh, in the British case, I think it, it was part of this kind of rather 
dangerous slide uh, into the Brexit process, which incidentally the book that's sort of moving around the room, which I edited on Brexit, um, is, is describing, um, particularly the, the, the first chapter covers that. Um, I won't say and think anything about deconstitutionalization and constitutionalization, but um, one way of that, that that's relevant, I think, if you're interested in the legal aspect of all of this, is that uh, the regularization of opt-outs uh, might be a preferable system to the current kind of rather ad hoc um, uh, setup. Um, Disintegration, differentiated integration, I think, are, are not the same, but they may, you know, how they relate um, is fairly open. Um, it's worth making the point, uh, it shouldn't go on much longer, but both Europeanisation and de-Europeanisation, I think, destabilise the existing constitutional <coughs> arrangements of the member states. Um, and again, in the British case, you can see this um, in which uh, agricultural policy, for example, uh, where do the, assuming Brexit happens, which I have a, I'm becoming slightly more optimistic that we might, might just about get away without it, but, um, you know, the, the, the odds are still stacked very firmly in favour of uh, it happening. Uh, if it does happen, uh, what do you do with agricultural policy? Do those powers go from Brussels to London, or do they go also to Edinburgh, to Cardiff, uh, to Belfast, to the regional uh, or sub-national uh, components of the UK? And other issues, again, um, massively uh, you know, destabilising the uh, settlement. The Irish border is the most dramatic case, you know. We could imagine the Irish Civil War restarting uh, as a result of Brexit. We could imagine, in a happier scenario, uh, a united Ireland as a result of it. Um, you know, those, those are open possibilities. Um, so you may think this is just a British problem and the British have gone crazy, and I agree. Um, but the British problem does have, I think, a more general um, significance. What it demonstrates is the insuperable obstacles uh, which Antje Wiener in the chapter in her chapter in the book that's that's going around um, discusses in some detail the obstacles to disentangling the links formed by membership even if uh, you happen to be like the British outside the Eurozone and outside the Schengen area. Um, So it's destabilizing those arrangements. It's also destabilizing, in the, the particular case of de-Europeanization, marginalizing the UK Parliament, marginalizing the ju judiciary. Uh, you might have seen a, a headline in um, a British newspaper describing three High Court judges, Supreme Court judges, as enemies of the people. I mean, that kind of language um, very much um, straying into British political discussion. Um, so I think that means that de-Europeanisation à l'anglaise is going to be, remain a, a negative example for other member states, as you can see in uh, <coughs> poll results just after the, the Brexit referendum. Um, but a more likely outcome is a further extension of, of policies which don't directly challenge the EU but attempt to evade or water down its arrangements. So it's a bit like if you know Colin Crouch's wonderful book on post-democracy, what he wrote in Berlusconi's Italy. Um, um, so democracy is, isn't replaced by a sort of Nazi-style Machtergreifung. It's undermined in more surreptitious ways, as it was by Berlusconi and is, is you know, happening uh, in other uh, states as well. Um, and that... You know, you can see how that would happen in the EU itself, drifting away from transnational approaches to further development of open coordination, uh, ad hoc agreements, um, what Jürgen Habermas, following a number of legal theorists, has called executive federalism, so deals done uh, by um, state, heads of state and government. Uh, and a weakening of uh, European uh, methods. Whether that's a permanent change of course for the European polity or whether it's just the sort of back and forth movement 
that you get in all federal systems um, remains to be seen. There's good survey evidence, a uh, nice piece by, by Catherine de Vries, um, suggesting that European, Union, uh, European opinion tends to favour a more flexible and selective approach, uh, a somewhat less transnational European Union with more popular input through referendums, uh, focused on peace and security and economic growth rather than energy security or climate change. I don't know how you have economic security without worrying about climate change, but um, that's the, the way European opinion seems to be at present. Um, and there's no support, interestingly, particularly from this part of the world, for the most dramatic form of narrowing, the return to a smaller Europe, uh, a smaller Europe of six members or 15 members, uh, a return, a sort of westernization of, of the EU, no support for that. Um, all this suggests, I think, that the central issue will be the further development of the Eurozone, um, about which I'm completely incompetent to talk about, but Stuart will be <laughs> possibly talking about. Um, um, in one scenario, at least, I'm just to just venture one remark about it, in one scenario this drives the, the European <coughs> Union in a kind of federal direction, whether or not the European public are particularly enthusiastic about that development. Um, and Anthony Giddens has argued um, in a book in 2013 along those lines. Um, he's kept rather quiet in the Labour discussion because he doesn't hesitate to use the F word in his book and no doubt would uh, still be committed to a, a federal Europe. Um, the alternative is that the Eurozone might b become a kind of core of the Union, which to some extent it is already, with a larger, more fragmented outer circle. And again, you might see that scenario as a realistic accommodation to political reality, to economic reality, um, or you might see it as seriously damaging uh, form of de-Europeanization in a context which is increasingly dominated by populism, but also nationalism, uh, xenophobia, and so on. So European integration began at a time when this kind of nationalist politics had just wrecked the continent, and we have to confront, I think, the possibility that it may succumb to it again. Sorry to bring the bad news. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think it's ironic. <laughs> ironic that the EU may have more impact on the e on the UK after it's left the EU than it did when it was inside the EU. Mm -hmm. And one of the th topics that we'll be discussing um, next week will be populism. Um, but there is a discourse on something <coughs> called sado-populism. I don't know if you've heard no. of that. Mm. Where um, uh, the, the people who are supporting these populist leaders and populist policies are in fact the population that is most it. hurt mm -hmm. by those Just policies. Mm -hmm. so, so there is this new discourse on sado-populism. <laughs> All right, so we will now continue with Stuart. Thank you. You said you had six points. I have six points and uh, perhaps we're going to be able to put them up on the screen. Six points. <laughs> no, six, six, <laughs> just six points. Is it a Word document? A Word document, yes. Just the future of democracy. It's on my it's on my pin which is plugged in already, so it should be just future of democracy. It's under I ask, but forget that. Just it should come up if you type in the future of democracy. First one. All this improved technology. Yes. <laughs> I've never seen a screen you can tap on. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yes. So, uh, I'm delighted to be sitting next to William, but I'm afraid I probably don't agree with him very much. 
Now, uh, and even I can't read this from here, <laughs> but I think the first should be talking about democracy and the environment. What, yes. is, what does it yeah. say? Um, in uh, question. Both in democracy question. And in question. Indeed, indeed. Um, I have I have a book which can be available in PDF called Europe in Question and What to Do About It. If you want to follow through on some of the points I'm making, uh, the second point I think is about money. Global governance, where Keynes was right. Ah, on. yeah. Let, well, let's just touch on that. One of the things that struck me, I, I started as a historian with history and political theory uh, and then reluctantly changed to economics. And one of the things that really bored me was every economist in Britain in the 1960s assumed that he or she was a Keynesian and that Keynes had solved the economic problem. Keynes hadn't. Keynes had addressed one economic problem, underconsumption. There's somebody else with a four-letter surname, and his first name is Carl, <laughs> had, had actually addressed several economic problems, including underconsumption, overproduction, which is not the same. You can be on a trend where you get vast overproduction. Think of the European auto industry now disproportion between sectors which we have on a chronic scale between finance and manufacturing uh, and the, the, the general tendency uh, to instability and crisis rather than equilibrium. Now the third, the, the, but a further point is I think important. Keynes Oh, for example, uh, George Bernard Shaw, an uh, Irish dramatist of much fame in, uh, in Britain, who also was the founder of the Fabian Society, gradual, uh, the case for gradual socialism, said to Keynes, you really must read some Marx. And Keynes replied in writing, I had another shot at the old KM. Uh, I'm sorry, but in neither him nor Engels can I find anything except out-of-date controversializing. But more than this, although Keynes had high-level political experience, <coughs> he was very naive. He really thought you could have a supranational global governance system. So the Keynes plan, you know, which virtually nobody criticized in, in the 60s, uh, the Keynes Plan, 1943, the basis for Bretton Woods. But Keynes had proposed <laughs> that exchange rate changes would balance trade. Well, unfortunately, they don't. There's, I think the lower paper, uh, the lower reference is something that I just put on the web with a colleague, Andrew Black. Uh, economic theory is completely redundant in terms of assuming that with David Ricardo, 1817, that exchange rate changes, putting currencies up or down, will balance global trade. Ricardo's case was a fraud, a very clear fraud. He said that trade between England, he didn't say Britain, Trade between England and Portugal, with England selling cloth and Portugal selling wine, would be to the mutual advantage of both countries. But he didn't admit capital mobility and investment between the two countries. Whereas the wine trade of Portugal at the time, the, it was the addiction and affliction of the middle and upper classes was in port. Port is basically wine with some brandy added, yes? Don't ever buy an old port uh, in any airport because unlike wine, the older port doesn't, doesn't improve anyway. On the substance of the point, 
the globalization crisis is due to capital mobility between countries. It's due to what Ricardo denied. And then, unfortunately, an overlorded economist called Paul Samuelson from 1944 to 2004 wrote articles on how comparative advantage will maximize global welfare without any capital mobility. None. By the time he wrote his last paper in 2004, over half the production, over half the exports of China were from foreign direct investment. How many of you got an apple? I don't, but how many of you? A bit more? I, uh, come on, come on, come on, be honest. <laughs> right. Uh, how many hundred euros did you pay for your apple? Your, whether it's an app or an iPad? Several hundred. What's the production cost in China Eight. of an iPhone? Eight. Eight. Eight dollars. Now you can say, well, that's not the development cost, but the development costs were actually paid by governments. For example, Google's algorithm came out of a federally funded program. Touchscreen displays came out of a federal program. So why am I criticizing Keynes? Uh, not just for historical reasons, but I, I never was persuaded that intergovernmental decisions should be supranational that decisions should be imposed on some countries against their will. And it was on that basis that I empathized with Charles de Gaulle uh, and happened to get to, you can check some of this out on week. Well, actually, it's in, it's in the second chapter of the book, Europe in Question. The second chapter is de Gaulle says no to the British application to join the EEC. And the third is de Gaulle says yes, which has been overlooked by nearly every economic and political historian, but on a confederal basis. And uh, Ferry knows very well and doesn't agree with me uh, in the strength of my criticism of Jean Monnet. But Jean Monnet was a disaster. I mean, he proposed supranational decision making by what was called qualified majority voting. Now, if the qualification had been that some member states needn't do it, that would have been all right. But it's qualified only by voting population. And that is sensible, of course, because the weight of Germany should come from more than the weight of Luxembourg. But the reality was de Gaulle pulled out, and I'm going to shift from history uh, more to the, the present in a moment. De Gaulle pulled his ministers out of all the councils of the then European community in 1965, July 1965. And he only came back in January 1966 by what was called the Luxembourg Compromise. And French civil servants are really very good. And they drafted a very simple compromise. The increase of majority decision making which could minoritize member states, the majority weight it could easily minoritize uh, a, a Portugal or a Poland, uh, would apply, and there are extensive references to this all over the place in the Rome Treaty of 1957, except in cases of important national interest, which killed it. In other words, a member state could say, all right, you want that, but it's not in my national interest. And that would have given us a confederal Europe, which would have avoided, in my view, many of the problems that we now face. So where do we, where do we get uh, after that? And um, more? Okay. Um, major emerging potential, cities and local action, feasible countervalence of transnational okay. capital. Good. Yeah. Let's move. I mentioned yesterday. Uh, when we have all these very pessimistic scenarios, uh, for example, I, I, th I think Jody very kindly put a paper on the web in which I've, I've critiqued sweeping generalizations about populism. Hmm? Populism is often people saying, no, we don't want this. We don't want austerity. We don't want a Eurogroup 
of finance ministers that has no, in, in the Eurozone, there's a Eurogroup of finance ministers that has no basis in any treaty, that keeps no minutes other than for itself, publishes no minutes, reports to no democratic authority, and has imposed destruction, for example, on Greece, penalizing Greece because German and, and French banks lent to Greece when they should have realized it would be insolvent. And the Greek people are paid. And the imposition, I develop in, 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 uh, in Europe in question, the emergence of something absolutely tragic, not an effective European democracy, but a German hegemony, ideological and political hegemony. And sadly, partly because it's Keynes fault again, uh, most, most Germans uh, in politics are economically illiterate. That's also the case in British politics, uh, <laughs> let, let me add, but I don't want to discriminate against the Germans here. But unfortunately, Keynes, when Keynes wrote what was a bestseller in Germany after World War I, in 1920, uh, he brought out a book called The Economic Consequences of the Peace, and he pointed out that the imposition of sanctions on Germany would be disastrous, not least because, let's give a simple example, the French had to, had to give Germany railway carriages, trucks, etc., etc., because of the damage, uh, or Germany had to give France uh, machinery, tools, etc., etc. So you had temporarily high levels of employment in Germany and unemployment in France. But unfortunately, Keynes, in his preface, said to his general theory, 1936, in the German edition, he said, I've written this book for the economics of liberal democracies. <coughs> but I have to admit that this could be more easily applied in a totalitarian regime. Now, that has been seized by the von Mises Institute <coughs> in Germany. The ultra-neoliberals <coughs> are saying Keynes was a fascist. And it's very, very difficult now to find more than, say, six Keynesians in, in the whole of Germany, besides which Keynes has only addressed one aspect of the economic problems that we now face. Now, what I suggested yesterday is how do we confront this potentially cataclysmic climate change? And what I said was uh, it's none of us in this room, or uh, few of us, are going to be able to change these mega decisions at very, very high levels uh, in bodies like the Eurogroup, which aren't even transparent. But most of us live in cities. I'm very glad <coughs> this one is very, very small. Yes, I was a member of parliament for a constituency in central London for 11 years, and uh, London is very, very big. I mean, it takes a long time even to get near something nominally called the country, which is still urbanized. But most of us live in cities. And what I <coughs> recalled yesterday was an initiative that I since have discovered isn't even on the web. Uh, but next week, uh, I'll make sure that it is. It was called Alternative Traffic in Towns, ALTA. Now, it's not referred to in Europe in question. It's not <coughs> referred to in this paper on, on economics, but it will be on the web. And for those of you who are still around next week, I'll give you the web link. How did it happen? It was not my idea. It was an idea of somebody working with me. Uh, and I'm briefly, therefore, going to repeat something I said yesterday. He said, look, if we, if we want to go green, we've got to give a message to the major auto producers that the demand is going to be green. And it's quite interesting, for example, one of the, one of the uh, 
one of the team on the project was Volvo. And Volvo explained to me that they had low emission and zero emission technologies, but the senior management said, no, for God's sake, there's no demand. How do you generate the demand? And it happened that uh, new labor was coming in, on which I had many other regrets, and uh, I'd already resigned from Parliament because I could see it coming. But I knew the Deputy Prime Minister, John Prescott, very well, who happened to be, we'd worked together on various things in the past. And he happened to be Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Transport and the Environment. And it was conventional at that time, uh, still to a lesser extent, that whoever had the presidency of the European Council, and uh, the European Council is heads of state and government, the head of state of France, the rest of the head of government, that it was conventional that whoever chaired the European Council should have some initiatives. So I said, look, you need an initiative for alternative traffic in towns. You, we should get major cities to declare that they're going to go for low emission zones. No clean vehicle, no entry. It's as simple as that. So many people feel disempowered in many regards now, but actually that can be decided by a city. And uh, a classic case of Weberian bureaucracy John, some of you will never have heard of John Prescott. A few of you might have done, but he's a very strong personality. Uh, working class background, seaman. Uh, anyway, John actually was chairing the Kyoto Conference, no less, in the coming six, uh, in, in those six months, at the end of uh, 1997. And he got me in, and he got in one of his very senior civil servants and said, right, Stuart Holland's got this initiative. He's going to get at least half a dozen capital cities in Europe within six months to declare they're going for low emissions. Uh, and when I get back from Kyoto, I want to see uh, what you've done. You got back from Kyoto, the civil servant had done nothing, nothing at all. Now, John has a very violent tongue. Uh, and he used some F words, and the F words were not federalism, <laughs> <laughs> and said, I don't want to see you through that door again. In other words, I'm going to have nothing to do with you. But the civil servant won. And because we couldn't put in a bid for European funds in time, because the civil servant had not done anything, uh, there was a funding crisis. Anyway, this civil servant boldly told the Deputy Prime Minister, well, Prime Minister, we know you have great confidence in Mr. Holland, but quite frankly, uh, we're not assured that he will be able to get six capital cities within six months. Within six months, I had the capital cities, London, Berlin, Paris, Rome, Athens, Lisbon, and 130 others. Now, I want to stress I'm not saying that to congratulate myself. I'm saying that what we would actually done here was nothing to do with Keynes's effective demand, put pump money into or out of the country. It was identifying latent <coughs> demand. Cities wanted to do something about traffic, about pollution, but they hadn't actually got their act together. And an initiative the initiative, although it nominally came from to the UK, I said yesterday, the initiative actually was effective because it was led by Florence and supported by the region of Tuscany. Now, how did that work? For example, I persuaded, I persuaded Florence to, I, I said, look, I mean, you've got a network of European city, of, of Italian cities? Uh, they said, of course we have. And I, I said, oh, how, how, how did you get it together? They said, well, in case the government says something really stupid that is not in our interest, uh, we, you know, we've got a network. We put the message out. And the next day, we can bring out a press statement. Overnight, 
we got 18 Italian cities, all the major Italian cities. And that was effectively through networking, not from authority, not from position power. Florence had no power over other Italian cities, but it worked. Then the project ran into, I think I said this yesterday, I won't repeat it at great length again, it ran into a funding problem because the brilliant European Commission, such enlightened people, said, uh, well, we're sorry you've got 130, they didn't actually say we're sorry, but we know you've got 130 cities. Uh, unfortunately, we can only fund uh, traffic and environment uh, solutions in three. Three. But why, do, why don't you go ahead on a micro scale? Well, we didn't go ahead on a micro scale because that wouldn't help Volvo, the, 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 the green vehicle people in Volvo, get Volvo to do a major demand shift. It has to be a macro project. And the cities are in between micro projects and macro outcomes. And one of the, one of the concepts that I've developed with others is meso. What is meso? Mesos. It's the Greek for in between. And therefore, there are levels at which you could act. I mean, check out whether your home city or wherever you're based at the moment has got a low emission zone. And introduce in this way uh, very considerable progress. And I checked it out on, on looking for whether there's any reference to the Alter Project on the web. I checked out, uh, and there wasn't. Uh, but there are over 200 European cities which either have already introduced low emission zones or are introducing them. And for example, Volvo now is not producing anything except uh, low emission or zero emission vehicles. And I think you all know that uh, for different, for, well, for different but related reasons, Toyota, Honda, have got hybrid vehicles which are very popular in California and so forth. So where do we get now? Um, G20. You, yeah, your last point was um, G20 minus one. Yeah. I think um, <coughs> the United Nations is admirable but near to utterly ineffective. And one of the cases that I made 10 years ago was that an operational body at a transnational level could be the G20. The G20 accounts for about 85% of what happens in economies in the world. And the, I made the case that it should establish a world development organization. Why? Because the World Trade Organization is a neoliberal institution with this neo-Ricardian fantasy that trade without capital movements will maximize global welfare for everybody. And it doesn't. I mean, the, the entry of China into the WTO has been absolutely brilliant for China. China has lifted about 600 million people out of poverty. India has been lifting about 300 million people out of poverty. And that's a fantastic gain. But the inverse, because the, the inverse has been deindustrialization, which, for example, has helped, uh, helped the rise of Trump. I mean, the, the rust belts of what previously were very strong industrial districts in the United States. And uh, he made, he, he, uh, when he was a candidate, there was uh, some less than intelligent manager in Ford had addressed the workers at a plant in the Midwest and say, uh, so we're going to locate in Mexico and it will be better for us all. And a trade unionist got up and just swore at him and said, ha, uh, you're going to locate in Mexico, and it will be better for you and your shareholders, but it's the end of jobs for us. 
Now, Trump identified with this. And Bill and Hillary and everyone else before had gone along with this rhetoric that the more you have free trade, the more you will have welfare. The argument is, we can't, you know, the argument is, uh, okay, China can have all the, all the low-wage jobs, but we'll get higher-wage jobs. Myth, fantasy, economic metaphysics. The, the higher-paid jobs didn't come. And they don't come because China also has the higher-paid jobs. In other words, the high-tech jobs are going to China by foreign investment, by American and European companies. So it's not surprising that globalization isn't working. But anyway, I made the case for what at that time I had suggested should be a world development organization to countervail the negative effects of the world trade organization. And uh, one of the things that I, when I, when I was in parliament, I was for a while, uh, we have shadow ministers Sometimes the shadow ministers are more real than the, the real. Uh, for example, I was shadow financial secretary to the Treasury, and the actual secretary of the Treasury was somebody called John Major, uh, who actually had applied for a job as a bus conductor uh, before he went into Parliament and had been turned down. Uh, but anyway, the... Uh, for four years, I was Shadow Development Secretary, Development Cooperation. And I was invited to China, and I was, I was working with Willy Brandt and others on global development issues. And I was invited to India by a remarkable person who sadly died last year called Nirupam Sen. And he became the Indian High Representative to the United Nations. And he said, Stuart, listen, you're always coming up with ideas. Well, why, don't you, why don't you come up? I've seen your suggestion of World Deve Development Organization. Come to New York, and I'll get some people together. Well, he did. Uh, who did he get together? Well, he was representing India, but he invited the Chinese, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the South Africans, the Brazilians, the Mexicans, uh, Canada, and the U.S., and even the deputy high representative from the U.S. came, and he, I also got him to inv invite Italy, France, and Germany. French didn't come to the meeting that we had, but the... Uh, I'll finish in a, a minute or two. Uh, but the German came, and to allow me to make a very positive point about a German diplomat, uh, having I, I did a short memo. I, was, I learned very early on, if you want people to read something, don't read more than a page and a bit. Mm? Attach something if you want, but you know. Five paragraphs, six points, six points maximum. Um, he opened the meeting by saying, it's very refreshing to have a Brit with all the pragmatism associated with the British come up with a proposal that might work. And he said, of course, it's not going to work immediately, but when all else fails, it may do. And I modified that now, uh, instead of a global development organization, to propose an economic and environmental security council of the G20 and G20 minus one. Why minus one? Fairly evident. Uh, if there's a Trump administration, he's not going to roll along. But on the other hand, I do think that the, uh, the feasibility of joint actions being taken, including, for example, the Chinese, yesterday reference was made to the fact that on solar panels, you know, the Chinese are now the world leaders. And the design, you know, we know all the pollution in Chinese cities. Now, what about decision making? Uh, allow me, allow me. Because we need to get back to European democracy. That's oh, really? I thought this was about the future of democracy, and not the future yes, yes. of European democracy. Yes. Oh, forgive me. Um, what about decision making? What I've argued in this case 
was enabling decision making. That is to say, if you want to do it, you do it, but you don't impose it on people who don't. And that actually has come up now in something called enhanced decision making inside the European Union. And a remarkable failure of, so you, it's not the Monet principle, it's the inverse of the Monet principle. But I think that the Chinese and the others, the Chinese, very powerful now, very cautious diplomatically, could well cooperate with other major states. And I'll just end on Sao Paulo. I don't know if I mentioned Sao Paulo yesterday. Sao Paulo's got 26 million people. I checked it out on the web. It's got some environmental policies, which are more parks and please use buses. But if Sao Paulo were to introduce a low emission zone, and that meant no clean vehicle, no access, then no major car producer would sell any vehicles in the whole of Brazil unless they were low emission or zero emission. And so you have leverage here from cities as, as well as potential for other joint action. Okay. Thank you, Stuart.